going back to the concept of what he brought up of nanotechnology, is it fair to say it's a, a little robot? Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about a nanobot or whatever? Nanotechnology is being able to design technology where the key features are a few nanometers, or at least less than 100 nanometers in scale. So electronics is already actually past that threshold. Right now, the key features in, in chips are 65 nanometers. There's already chips working under 50 nanometers. Uh, if you look at the Intel's and the Semiconductor Industries Roadmap, by 2020, the chips will have four nanometer features. That's about 20 carbon atoms. So, and another key step is that we'll go from the second dimension into the third dimension. Chips today are flat. We live in a three-dimensional world. We might as well use the third dimension. And that is going to, we, we will uh, ultimately run out of speed or steam with uh, Moore's law, shrinking the key features on a flat circuit. We'll need to go into the third dimension. That's going to be the next paradigm, actually the sixth paradigm in electronics. And chip designers, if you talk to the Intel scientists as I have, they're very confident that the crossover point between two dimensions and three will be uh, in the teen years, well before we run out of steam with Moore's law. So electronics is going to be revolutionized by being able to build electronic circuits as well as communication devices in three dimensions uh, at the molecular level using self-organizing circuits. We'll also be able to create small devices that have mechanical capabilities, that have computers and communications built in. Uh, and these can go inside the human body, keep us healthy from inside. That's going to be one major application. And there's already uh, significant harbingers of that that we can see. Uh, there's four major conferences on something called BioMEMS, Biological Microelectronic Mechanical Systems. Dozens of experiments are placing blood cell sized devices in the bloodstream of animals to produce, in some cases, very sophisticated uh, therapeutic effects. And that's today. And if you apply this, billion fold increase in the price performance and capability and bandwidth of electronics, communication, uh, and 100,000 fold shrinking of mechanical technology over the next quarter century, uh, you get some idea of what will be feasible. San Francisco is next with a question about voice technology. Um, hi, I have a question. I'm a reti retired court reporter and I'm very interested in uh, what the status is of verbatim real time voice rec recognition technology, specifically translation uh, into text and that could be uh, purchased by the consumer. And if you could address the le legal and privacy issues that might restrict use of the technology, such as, you know, recording, recording uh, conversations, for instance, in California, it's illegal without the consent of both parties. And the second part of my question is, Will this technology, do you see it playing some role in uh, transparency of government and politicians, um, perhaps on the internet, um, to um, provide the consumer and the citizenry uh, a, a better line into what's going on with government? Thank you. Well, you bring up some interesting issues. In fact, speech recognition is widely used today for surveillance by intelligence agencies, because they do listen in one way or another to millions of conversations around the world. Uh, we don't have enough people to actually listen to them, so we use speech recognition. They use speech recognition to uh, try to actually interpret what people are saying. And you'll run into speech recognition on the phone. There are millions of people that use speech recognition to create their written documents. I put together a prototype with uh, my company in the 80s created the first large vocabulary speech recognition. We took a contemporary version of that, combined it with speech synthesis and language translation to create a, a translating telephone. And, and actually, we have a demonstration of that, yeah. uh, that uh, available for our viewers. One of my companies, we developed the first text-to-speech synthesis. That was the company that developed the first reading machine. This was in the 70s. And another company that I started, developed the first large vocabulary speech recognition that was actually commercially marketed. And I put those two together with some contemporary language translation software and created a, a translating telephone. And I've actually used this to communicate with people in other countries. And uh, this will be a routine service of your cell phone in a few years, early in the next decade. This is a demonstration. 
comma. Dies ist eine Demonstration. Of a prototype. Of a quote translating end quote telephone. Period. Von einem Prototyp eines übersetzenden Telefons. Within a few years, comma. Innerhalb einiger Jahre. We will be able to talk to anyone, comma. Wir werden fähig sein, zu jemandem zu reden. Regardless of their language, period. Uh, the translations aren't perfect, but some of them are actually quite good. Uh, human translators are better, but the human translators aren't always available. Now, for important UN discussions, they use human translators, but uh, this would be a routine way to communicate around the world. Merci pour votre attention. Period. Thank you for your attention. And what year will that become commonplace, do you think? I think early in the next decade. Uh, this will be a routine service of your cell phone and communicators. Uh, of course, we have language translation software already on the internet. It varies in quality. The better systems are actually quite good. I was out at Google, and they showed me an English to Arabic and Arabic to English translator they had put together. Uh, because they have these very large Rosetta Stone texts, where they have the same text translated in English and in the other language, in this case, Arabic. And they, and, we c and they can use pattern recognition software to automatically find the translation rules. They didn't actually tell it how to translate. They, they said they let the software find its own rules. And this system actually compared well to human translators. And nobody on the team that created it spoke a word of Arabic. So the system actually found its own rules. And so language translation is getting, is getting better. We have an uh, email, and I don't have the email, but it says, what kind of technology do you use personally? Well, I use remote desktop to actually always be on my computer at work because I don't want to have multiple copies of my files. So I take around a little notebook and connect through high-speed connection, whether I'm in a town car or in a, or in a uh, hotel room, and I'm on my computer at work. I, I use search engines. I use both Google and Microsoft. And uh, I use pretty routine technologies, uh, different databases, uh, nothing too exotic, but actually find, well, I actually have one interesting technology that enable, that's a virtual reality technology enables me to be uh, at another venue in 3D. And a third of my speeches I actually give using this virtual reality technology. It's uh, called Teleport Tech. And I appear at the venue in three dimensions, life size. I can move around. As I move around, the audience sees the local background behind me, so it looks like I'm there. And it's pretty convincing. One guy actually walked up to me to give me a question on a piece of paper. And I'm actually the only speaker in the world that has one in my office, because I get invited to give speeches in Asia and Europe and Australia, and I can't always go there. So I'd, and this is expensive technology today. We have to send a technician with the other half of the equipment to the venue and set up communication lines. This will actually be routine, ubiquitous technology early in the next decade. We'll have images written directly to our retina from our eyeglasses. They'll be able to create virtual reality environments, either overlaying real reality. So I'll have pop-up displays. When I see you, there'll be a little pop-up saying, reminding me it's your birthday next Tuesday, or reminding me what your name is, or reminding me where, you know, where a building is that I'm looking for, or completely overtake visu the visual field of view and create a virtual reality environment so you and I could meet in a virtual Cancun beach, uh, even if we're hundreds of miles apart. And we'll feel just like we're there. Uh, this will actually be routine technology in the, in the second decade of this. As it gets more complex, though, if you give speeches m thousands of miles away, doesn't it take out the personal element of human communication? And isn't that one of the key components of being human, I guess, being able to communicate? No, actually, it's, it's, it's doing the opposite. It's enhancing human communication because I can communicate. I mean, they see me in real time. It's not recorded. It's, li it's real time. I see the audience. I can establish eye contact like I'm doing now. I can point at people and, uh, and it all, the technology actually works correctly. And this is how this future virtual reality technology will work also. But we have early versions of that already. I mean, the telephone was the first virtual reality technology that enabled you to be with someone else just as if you were together 
even if you're hundreds of miles apart, and that had never happened before in human history. And uh, that's actually how they saw it. I mean, uh, before that, you had to actually get together to talk to someone. And it, those are not virtual. I mean, the word virtual is unfortunate, as if it, this, these aren't real conversations. You can't say, oh, well, that wasn't a real agreement I made. That was in the virtual reality environment called the telephone. No, I mean, those are real conversations between real people communicating. And the Internet now, because of its decentralized nature and the fact that it's everywhere, allows us to create communities based on common interests. So if someone has, let's say, a chronic disease, they can create communities of other people and gather information and stay abreast of that condition around the world or any subject, whether it's you know, collecting cat figurines, which I do. Uh, I, can, I can be in touch with all the other cat figurine lovers around the world and create a community. Uh, so we're not stuck with the communities of geographic accidents, the people that happen to be near us. We can create communities with people around the world. And you go around, you see people on their cell phones and on their communicators and on their notebooks. And they are communicating not just with the people in their vicinity, but with groups around the world. And also enhances work environments. I mean, I have work groups that are, that are uh, spread out geographically, and we work very effectively together. And that wasn't feasible 10 years ago. You brought up virtual reali rea reality. Uh, with that in mind, who is Ramona? Well, this is a, a project that started a number of years ago. Uh, she's a female, uh, she's my female alter ego. And I wanted to demonstrate at this conference called TED, Technology Entertainment Design, uh, at the 2001 TED conference, a feature of virtual reality that you can be someone else. Because I, I mentioned that you, know, you and I could go into a virtual reality environment and uh, take a walk on a virtual Cancun beach in, in virtual reality environments. And we'll have virtual bodies in these virtual reality environments, particularly when it's through the nervous system. When we have uh, nanobots in our brains they can shut down the signals coming from our real senses, replace them with the signals that your brain would be receiving if you were in the virtual environment. Then it'll feel like you're in that virtual environment. And design of new virtual environments will be a new art form. And as I go to move my hand, it'll move my virtual hand. And so I can be an actor in this virtual environment. We can shake hands and give each other a hug, or we can, take, we can run on the beach or sit down at a desk uh, and have it experiences in these virtual reality environments. But your, your body doesn't have to be the same body that you have in real reality. A couple could become each other, for example. And, all, and so I wanted to demonstrate how you could do that. So I had magnetic sensors in my clothing. As I moved, a life-size, realistic, real-time animation, pretty photorealistic, of Ramona moved exactly the way I did. My voice was changed into her voice using some other computer technology. And that drove her lips. And so it looked like she was giving the presentation. But I was actually being transformed into her. And the audience could see me and her. And, and actually, we have a demonstration to show the folks at home. But well, virtual reality, you can be who you want to be. And you can be where you want to be and with whom you want to be. And you can even have been who you want to have been. Well, my childhood was kind of tough, although I didn't really think about that at the time. You know, you don't really have much to compare to. But my pa, he was always trying hard, but he never did seem to be able to hold on to a job. Well, I haven't written that many songs, but I try to express what's most deeply on my mind. In virtual reality, you can be someone else. You don't have to be the same boring person all the time. I mean, you all have these personalities inside you that don't quite fit with your bodies in real reality. So basically, most people just like kill them all off. Some people don't actually keep any of their personalities, which reminds me of some of my old boyfriends, but that's another story. Mr. Kurzweil. So this is actually a serious project that I intend to continue with and actually make Ramona more realistic and actually more independent. I have this bet with Mitch Kaper that a computer will pass the Turing test by 2029. And I intend that to be Ramona, actually an independent version of Ramona, who would, because some, an ent a computer that passes the Turing test is not some so dry, lifeless box. It'll have a personality and an appearance and will be just like, just like a human. And uh, so this is actually a project that I intend to continue with to, to make Ramona more lifelike and more realistic over time. If you're interested in